So I really don't think we can finish by Thursday. You can have two minutes. <laughs> I really, I, I busted my butt to get us done within three. But I mean, come on, have a little sympathy for me. Could you do all of computer science in three lectures? I think we want more of this. Yes. <sighs> yeah. So okay. So let me remind us of where we are. I'm just going to have to step back here just to do the. Oh, it turns out funky, doesn't it? Okay, so um, we're still in the middle of Mars levels of analysis on cognitive systems, and we were just about to go into the neuroscience level, I think, the uh, and and look at Posner and neuroscientific methods. So let's get there. Today, we will certainly get to the history of computational cognitive models, which is a big foundation for the way that I think about things, certainly. We may step into epistemology. Epistemology has to do with how we as psychologists know what we know, what constitutes a legitimate method. This is something that you need to know something about because you do interact with human participants, human subjects from time to time when you're testing your systems. And you ought to know something about what constitutes a legitimate test, something that would stand up to scrutiny by behavioral scientists. So I want to make sure I keep that in trouble. Uh, we will not get to computational cognitive model components. And what that's going to be is a closer look inside this history of computational cognitive models for the individual units that are there, memory units, attentional processes, et cetera. And I doubt that we're gonna be able to look at <laughs> the specific computational models for natural language tests, but at least you'll have the groundwork for thinking about that issue. Okay, so we had just talked about the algorithmic level, I believe. Um, I don't know, did I make the point that um, there's a, a, let me just repeat this because I don't recall how effective I was in making these points. Um, at the algorithmic level, psychologists and cognitive scientists in general have a process model orientation, which means that we are interested in the sequence of events and inferences that unfold over time. And because of this, we often use response time measures of behavior. So we can tell that something it requires more cognitive processing, is more difficult if it takes longer. And there are assumptions in there about the seriality of processing and the absence of parallel processing capabilities. And so we typically talk about ourselves as, as limited capacity serial processors and what this does is it it forces a kind of um constrained rationality on our behavior yeah it's rational it's tethered to the environment we do the best we can but it's not going to be perfect because of this constraint on our thinking equipment we call that bounded rationality that comes from herb simon um at the algorithmic level, you will see, not now, but later when I talk about these components, knowledge representation issues. So how do we think as psychologists, knowledge is represented, at least abstractly, functionally, how does knowledge appear to behave? And you will see semantic network models of knowledge that are very familiar to you and of the kind that Amit often talks about, but you'll see other representations of knowledge as well. Um, we will talk a little bit about attentional processes, and I want to make two points about attention. There really are two functions here that you want to be worried about. One is this constant awareness of what's going on around you. So, you know, if a tiger should, you know, emerge from the hallway here, we're going to notice that. We are certainly going to stop paying attention to what I'm saying and focus on that target. So there has to be an attentional process that is focused on the environment because of dynamic events that could intrude. And they have to stop you from doing whatever it is that you were thinking about, which is sort of the 
second piece, which is sort of the, the between the ears piece of intentional processes, thinking about uh, your current goals, solving a particular problem, finding the relevant knowledge, all that sort of stuff, which is a kind of a between the ears notion of attentional processes. We've got to worry about both of them in human cognition. We should be worried about the role of intentionality. To what extent do goals matter in human behavior? This is not an uncontroversial topic. The philosopher Dennett suggests that goals and intentionality are really not causal in behavior. However, it is a useful notion for us to impose and infer goals on other people as a manner of predicting their behavior. This notion is called the intentional stance. It is very important from a philosophical perspective. And the name is Dennett, D-E-N-N-E-T-T. Um, and then, you know, all of this at the algorithmic level, you should appreciate is actually implemented in computational cognitive architectures and models. We have code <laughs> that, that mimics these algorithms and tests them. And we decide, you know, have we got the memory components right? Have we got the attentional processes right? Do, do we understand the knowledge properly? Have we got the search functions right? We implement all of this in uh, cognitive architectures and models. And that is primarily a, a focus from the Pittsburgh contingency of cognitive science. And that would be both Carnegie Mellon and Pitt where I come from. Okay, the neuroscience level. Now we're one level below in Ma Mars hierarchy, right? Um, call it wetware. <laughs> the actual equipment, thinking equipment that, uh, that does the computation to support all this higher level of analysis stuff. And I think we said, uh, we talked about um, neuron functions and neuron, uh, neurotransmitters. I think we did mention that. Um, and I talked about the fact that there's a nervous system anatomy, a peripheral nervous system and a, and a central nervous system and the central nervous system itself is very complex. I think we did talk about this a little bit um, the last time that we met. And then um, I wanna show you a video from Michael Posner, who I would say is the premier cognitive neuroscientist in, in our day. Have you heard of Posner? Has this ever come up with? Okay, I promise you, I promise you, Ludwig and Svetlana and Christian, everybody knows who Michael Posner is. I'm not giving you some arcane <laughs> citation. Who wants to get the Posner video up? And, and ideally what you're looking for as a cognitive neuroscientist is a kind of a convergence between the, the mechanisms at the neuroscience level and the behaviors that we can see at the algorithmic level. I knew about uh, Nancy Gannister. Pardon me? Uh, Professor Canister from MIT. Uh huh. I just I'm just following on her YouTube channel so she could brain my yeah yeah. So I just watch some videos sometimes. Now the whole the the MIT you know I just mentioned sort of a Pittsburgh view of the world with this focus on computational cognitive models. I would say that MIT is um, particularly interested and, and driven by this MAR levels of analysis. So it's not a surprise that we had a speaker from MIT talking about MAR. And it's not a surprise that Chomsky talked about the levels of yeah. the MAR levels of analysis. And it's not a surprise that Steven Pinker comes from MIT. There's sort of a whole world view that comes from that part of the country. And for those of you who find that I'm just rattling off like all these names and how are you going to remember and you know is this important and whatever. Oh, that if we don't remember professor's name, how we are going to follow their work? Yeah, well, you can't follow their work, but but I'm tr but the the location of where this work started 
is still influencing the scholarly thought in those areas. So when I say Pittsburgh, I'm not just saying it because that's where I come from, although that's true. It, it sort of gives you a framework for helping to get all this stuff organized. And the Pittsburgh view is a worldview. The MIT view is a worldview. Later on, we're going to talk a little bit about Midwestern psychology and how, how that um, has promoted a certain set of methods in, in cognitive science. And then there's the West Coast view, which is kind of a, 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 a mixture of a lot of different things. Um, there's the Colorado view, which we've talked about before. I'll mention that again. I think it's helpful to organize these people. <laughs> Recording in progress. Okay. <laughs> we will be then folding up. Huh? <laughs> oh, oh, okay. So, all right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I certainly don't have that. Also, select the option, share some. In our last segment, we did an overview of attentional research in his career, and in this segment, we'll discuss a little bit more the development of different techniques used in cognitive neuroscience. Work on attention began, of course, with purely behavioral methods, and those could involve everything from questionnaires, subjective reports of one state, to studies using reaction time or percent correct to measure let's say, the number of items that you could recall after a single glance or how quickly you could assimilate a single bit of information. And most of the work uh, in the 60s and 70s uh, centered around these behavioral methods. There were some physiological methods as well. For example, it was common to record from scalp electrodes the electroencephalogram, and also one could average those scalp electrode activity by presenting the same signal or a class of signals over and over again and getting the so-called event-related potential. So those methods were all available in the 60s and 70s. In the late 70s, there was added a new method of recording from individual neurons, of course not in human beings generally, although some uh, of this recording was done in neurosurgery patients but uh, mostly from uh, non-human primates. And then, uh, of course, in the late 80s, neuroimaging really began with the hemodynamic measures. So first we had positron emission tomography, which uh, allowed uh, one to look at blood flow in particular areas of the brain when the uh, alive uh, human being practice some particular skill. So, for example, uh, one of our earliest studies presented a visual or auditory word and tried to isolate the different operations that were involved in reading the word, that is, synthesizing the letters into a unit, getting the word name, getting the meaning, and so on. Sequence and uh, mindset. positron emission Potential. tomography was a bit cumbersome for a number of ways. It involved injecting a radioactive nuclide, although a relatively small amount of radiation. Radiation isn't generally good for you. And uh, so you could only use this technique once every six months on a given subject. Uh, and of course, you didn't really want to do it unless it was a very important question, the answer to which could be uh, useful for humans. For example, our original language studies, we thought of their utility being in guiding neurosurgery to avoid the language areas. And in fact, I think that has been a, a useful yes. uh, contribution. Yes, person who did that work. work. 
But not very long thereafter, a functional magnetic resonance imaging came. That method uh, doesn't exactly use blood flow. It uses the change in hemoglobin in red cells that occur when, um, uh, when blood flow is changed in a given area. And uh, since hemoglobin is paramagnetic, it can be sensed in a powerful magnetic field. And one can localize now to about a cubic millimeter or less the activity that occurs, uh, the neurons that are active in a given task. And of course, that method has opened up, uh, because it's completely non-invasive, it's opened up uh, running the same person multiple times, so one can look at individual differences between people. Uh, the big discovery from positron emission tomography was you could average across people, even for higher mental processes. But of course, there was a fairly good blur circle, and now you can see that maybe the individuals aren't using exactly the same circuitry. Yeah, I know that's still kind of an issue, is trying to decide if, if you're truly getting a good picture when you're averaging it's over about brains. about 10 years old. Really, your brain structure is, is very different between individuals. Yes, and uh, of course, you can get a story for an individual now using fMRI and use, using his own brain. And then you can see whether it's uh, whether the individual difference in circuitry is resolved when you look at the difference in anatomy that's present in those different brains. So those are tractable questions. They wouldn't be tractable without having fMRI as a method to uh, to resolve them. And of course, uh, now uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation has allowed us to manipulate particular areas of the brain uh, to put. To, to essentially present a transient lesion by uh, uh, stimulating over some particular area, you can make you, that area sort of non-functional during, during the stimulation. And uh, that's like knocking out an area, like a transient lesion. And that's very important because fMRI gives you a set of areas that are activated by a given task, but it doesn't tell you whether they're all necessary or not. Now how does that knock one out? Then you can see whether that it's that it was absolutely necessary because they can't Real ablation say, perform <laughs> that particular task anymore. Um, how is transcranial magnetic stimulation used? Like, how does it create this artificial lesion? Uh, well, it does it by stimulating an area, and therefore, you might say, scrambling the signals that would normally come from that area. So you actually. In a sense, it's a little bit like a, a very powerful stimulus that takes away the normal functioning of that area. And uh, there's another new tool that I consider a new tool, although it uses an old methodology. I mentioned uh, ele recording electrical activity from outside this, from the scalp, or you can also record magnetic uh, activity from outside the head. Now, that's been an old methodology in the sense that we've known about that electrical activity for almost uh, 80 years. But once you can't really go from a set of electrodes that are active on the scalp to say where in the brain it came from. But if you know where in the brain it comes from, from fMRI or other neuroimaging methods, then you can use algorithms to predict what the distribution should be on the scalp. And that allows you to go to use EEG, which gives you very rapid uh, responses, not as slow as the hemodynamic responses, which depend upon the uh, change in, in vasculature, change in the, in the veins and so on. The EEG allows you to get actually the activity of neurons in real time of course, not one neuron, many neurons. And once you can tell where that activity comes from, then you have both a time course and, uh, and as well uh, a localization. Moreover, you can use both fMRI and EEG to trace out the activity, the connectivity between different areas, functional connectivity, by looking at the correlated activity in remote electrodes by EEG or remote areas of the fMRI signal. And more recently, it's been possible actually to trace out the physical connections by using diffusion tensor imaging. 
when uh, water diffuses, it diffuses along the axons. So that can be sensed from a magnetic resonance imager with a slightly different signal than is usually used for uh, getting uh, gray matter activity. And so one can then trace the white matter and uh, actually look at the physical connections and relate them to the functional connectivity that one finds. So network tracing is a very big uh, approach to uh, cognitive neuroscience and I expect it to get much stronger in future years. So now we're talking about actually being able to map the interconnections between these associated brain areas and maybe proving some of the theories correct. Yes, I think both the, the being able to look at the full connectivity and also to be able to go in and knock out one node by, uh, by TMS gives you a pretty strong toolkit. There could be problems, however, in, uh, uh, because even a functional MRI with pretty, pretty precise localization, cubic millimeter, that's still many thousands of cells. In general, in my view, that really hasn't mattered much for psychological theory, but uh, in the last uh, year or so, I had to change my mind completely about that because we've come to understand the way in which cells behave in the frontal eye fields, and it turned out to be an amazing revelation. If you looked at functional MRI, the frontal eye fields are an important part of the orienting network, and it doesn't really matter whether you shift attention from location to location covertly, like in a visual search test where your eyes are fixed, or whether you make saccades. So the idea was, well, maybe attention was slaved on saccades, and uh, in fact, uh, it was really just a matter of suppressing the actual movement but the mechanism of attention was exactly the same as the mechanism of the scads. And as far as fMRI went, that seemed to fit the data great. Then people began to record from cells, and they found that within the fMRI blur circle, there are really two populations of cells, quite distinct. One population which carries, which is active before saccades, and a different population which is active when you're uh, searching without any movement at all. And uh, that work, which is carried out in uh, primates, not human, non-human primates with cellular recording, has shown that, you know, we just have to be able to look within the MRI blur circle in some cases to, in order to disentangle what's actually going on. And I say that was a surprise to me. I didn't think we were going to have to do that but uh, it does seem uh, required by this work. Now that you know that there are two population of cells, it could be that a very precise MRI image, knowing that fact, could separate those two populations of cells because their central tendency almost, per almost must be different. I mean, you wouldn't expect them to be exactly coincident. And uh, that will be an interesting question, but of course, you wouldn't know to look if you hadn't done these cellular studies. And do you think that fMRI will actually be capable of, of finding these smaller, more detailed distinctions? I, I think so, once they're known. But whether it will be fa capable of discovering them, that's another question. And uh, this is uh, going to be very important, for example, within <clears throat> the anterior cingulate, in which there are many different types of cells which are intermixed. As you might suspect, if you're going to have a structure that's going to be involved in self-control or self-regulation, it's got to have a lot of information. For example, it has to know about reward and punishment. It has to know uh, about pain. And uh, these are all things that have been discovered in the uh, anterior cingulate. And usually people write papers saying, well, it's a pain center. It's a, it's a center for uh, reward or so and so on. But uh, I think now we know we have to have a higher level concept in which this information is synthesized and allows certain control operations to take place. Okay. So I know a lot of researchers um, usually just stick with one type of, of uh, study, like they'll either use fMRI or they'll use EEG or they'll use this or that. So 
it sounds like you're thinking that researchers are really going to have to do a lot more of these combination studies where you to use one to get this idea and one to get this other idea. So well, you know from home improvement that if you always use a screwdriver and you never have any other tool, you won't be very effective. So we have a toolkit now, and uh, it may mean collaboration between different people. That is not, no one person necessarily has to know everything. But uh, I think once you have a toolkit, you have to apply the right combination of tools to do the job and develop the theory. And we're positioned to do that now. And uh, that means uh, these methods and also the t selection of appropriate tasks that really allow you to use the method effectively. All right, so that's the future of uh, I think this is a, this definitely is uh, what students need to be aware of in this, I think, why graduate school and postdoctoral work is more important uh, because although you don't necessarily need to know everything about using every tool, you kind of have to know what the range of tools are in order to know how to select them to solve your question. So in the future, I'm talking about this toolkit that you're speaking of, um, what kind of tools would you like to have down the road? Well, of course, one would like to have tools that allow you to measure the activity of single cells non-invasively. This would be very nice. I have no idea how you could do this. But one of the really exciting things about neuroimaging is that it is attractive, attracted into the general field of psychology, I would call it, or brain science, whatever you want to call it. People who skills in physics or engineering allow them to develop tools. And so uh, perhaps we will have tools that could even uh, solve this problem of looking very precisely at individual cells. Also, it would be very nice to know the expression of different genes within different parts of the brain non-invasively. So we could look at how gene expression occurs, let's say, in the anterior cingulate uh, in relationship to tasks or changes in life and so on. All right. Well, thank you very much for your discussion on different techniques in neuroscience. So a couple of points that I want to emphasize here. Notice the strong emphasis on brain anatomy and functional areas. Only at the very end did he say anything about, hey, let's look at an individual neuron. Now this could be in part because the tools that we have are region focused and um, anatomically oriented. But there's a great deal of literature that suggests that the structure of the brain is very important for understanding the processing. And so when you guys are using your connectionist neural network models of cognition, you know, from a psychological perspective, my strong suspicion is that you are vastly <laughs> oversimplifying the functionality of the brain and you're stuffing, you're putting functionality in the neuron that really is better associated with brain regions. And I, I, and I started off, you know, this particular set of lectures with the idea that I was very concerned that your approaches are putting too much functionality into your computational models. And we'd be better off identifying that functionality and associating it with different sub-modules in the, in the cognitive process. I just had one quick uh, question. So in the talk, he, uh, he mentions that uh, you should try to combine different data types of brains and then isn't it already very complicated to deal with one single data type which is related to brain? You have an expert right here who yeah, asked her. So what do you think? <laughs> so he says that uh, having those combinations will certainly... Well, my, my understanding, and since we have an expert here, she can override me, but some things are more sensitive to regions, other things are more sensitive to temporal progression, and so 
you really can't answer with just one method, but go ahead and say what you yeah, think. Like, so each region has their own independent functionality in the brain. And like one method can be good for one region, but certain methods, like we cannot analyze all things together, mix, mix all the things and then analyze it. Like it will mess up the system, I guess. I think, I think the framework that Posner gave you is probably the right one. One method will tell you that a certain region is relevant and another method, like IEG, will allow you, once you've determined that, will allow you to understand that process better. So like EEG and fMRI both have their uh, pros and cons. So EEG is good for temporal and fMRI is good for uh, spatial. spatial. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if we combine both of the modalities and try to pick up some tests, because this is this was very old video, but now these uh, experiments have been done to understand the language part that people are combining these two and then studying each region. Mm -hmm. So we we have data set for EEG and uh, fMRI for ABC. So we are going to do similar kind of study, like we are going to combine both of the data set and then try to understand brain region and what's happening. Like he explained everything about <coughs> Uh, subjects. So that is very common when you want to understand one region. So that will be fine if you just want to one region across many cases. But what if you if you want to understand many regions? You cannot do that. So averaging across subjects is fine if you want to study one region, but uh, that is not fine when you study, want to study the whole region. And, and as I've said before, there's this general notion that we will understand cognition as sequential processing. And so in order to get that full picture, you really do need to understand the progression throughout the brain's anatomical region. Small point that I wanna make here, it's a tiny little one, but I think it's important. Um, Poser talked about how there are attentional processes and attentional activation that are dissociated, he didn't use that word, but I will, dissociated from eye movement. So he said, you can see attentional activation even if you don't see eye movements. Anybody, any psychologist who uses eye movements as an indication of attentional processing ought to be pretty worried about that. And that just makes the point that there is always an underlying theory about the behavioral measures that we use and how they are related to underlying cognitive processes. And we could be, we could be wrong, but, but there's always such a theory. And when we talk about epistemology, I'll emphasize that point more. Uh, did you want to ask something? Deepa? Yeah, and according to me, fMRI are more robust and checking the eye movements better than the AI application. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that is true. Uh -huh. yeah. People are working on uh, facial recognition and all these things, understanding eye movements, but fMRI do way beyond that. And we can see actually that uh, eye movements can, uh, they can affect some of the brain region that will tell us that what actually people have looked at mm -hmm. because that will put right. all the activation map in the brain. Right. So you really need that. And the, the, the eye movement heuristic is really a pretty impoverished metric of attentional processing. But you will see it used quite a bit, actually, in, in human cognition. Let's go to the history of computational cognitive models. I'm going to abbreviate that by CCM. And what time is it? How, where are we? Oh my God. Okay. okay. Well, we're not getting very far, are we? Okay. Um, the history of computational cognitive models really starts with behaviorism. And you heard Chomsky, I think, talk about this. And, and the basic idea is that we can learn everything we need to know about human behavior 
by looking at the stimulus and the response. And they're not really denied, the behaviors didn't really deny that there was something that went on between the stimulus and the response. But the idea was that it was unknowable. And certainly at the time, we're talking, you know, some of this stuff was late 1800s and, and early 1900s. There was no way of looking at what was going on inside the, the, the black box. And um, so the idea was you can, you can do a pretty decent job just looking at the relationship between stimulus and response, and you don't need to know the black box. And that is very similar <laughs> to the connectionist model that you guys are using. You have a stimulus, you have an output, you have some unknowable regression model computation that relates the two. You don't need to know anymore. Good enough. It predicts the relationship, and that's it. That's all. And by, by, with neuroscience, it's not a black box. No, it's not. We can actually, we can actually see everything why it is happening. Th things have changed now, but the computational model that you guys are using for many of your cognitive computation still have that black box characteristic. Here's the stimulus, here's the response, and God only knows what's going on in the middle. But, but we can dig it into it and see like why the stimulus, why the You should. Nice you, you should, but that that is not the dominant method. Now, when Amit talks about um, infusing knowledge in the middle of, of the processing layers and trying to understand better what's going on there and guide what's going on there, I think he is consistent with the notion that there is more work to be done on this on this black box thing. But you heard Chomsky say, you know, this model has really infused a lot, sorry about that word, really contaminated a lot of um, computational processing models now, this stimulus response thing. You want to guess deeper? Not here. I'm not saying it, it, it's that we're following you that cup, but it has yeah. really dominated because you can do, you know, you can do a pretty good job relating stimulus to response without knowing what's going on inside the black box. But we can do that without using even black box methods. Well, I, you know, I, I wouldn't do that, but but nevertheless, that is part of the mindset. Um the the idea here was not as as pejorative as I'm making it sound. Um, you never want a more complicated model to explain results than you absolutely have to have. And so the behaviorists were really guided by Occam's razor that you know the, the, a nothing but explanation will do just nicely if your goal is to predict and control behavior. And that statement, that goal statement comes from Watson and that still dominates the goal of psychology, predict and control behavior. And when I get to this point when I'm talking in my um, much longer cognitive courses, um, I make the point that this makes psychologists some of the most dangerous <laughs> scientists in the world <laughs> that ever existed, because this really is our goal. Um, and so, as I was just saying, the notion was that there was a direct relationship between the environment and behavior. You don't need to worry about what's going on inside the, the, the black box. Um, subsequently, neo-behaviorism did introduce this notion of of drives and goals and motives into the explanation. And more or less at the same time, you had this notion of, of a kind of a, a, a goal hierarchy. Now, I wouldn't say that this idea, which comes from Maslow, and have you guys heard of Maslow's hierarchy? Has this ever, you ever heard of that term before? Okay. so. Maslow's hierarchy, I don't think, has really maintained a kind of a 
scholarly influence, but I would say that absolutely every psychologist is aware of this issue. And if you are to pay attention to anything that I might call folk psychology, meaning sort of everyday explanations of human behavior, this would be the one piece that I would suggest you pay attention to. So according to Maslow, you can think about drives and motivations and goals along this kind of hierarchy where the first level is physiological, the need for food and water and warmth and rest. And next you have safety needs, security, um, and then you know belongingness and love and relationships, self-esteem above that, feelings of accomplishment, self-actualization, achieving your potential, including creative activities. Um, I think that social scientists are also kind of broadly inspired by this notion, because the idea is that you can't really start worrying about achieving your full potential if you don't have food and water and warmth. I promise you, people who are recovering from the earthquake in Turkey right now are not worried about self-actualization. They're way down here at food, water, warmth, and rest. Um, for those of us who are interested in educational applications, um, you are not going to get to self-actualization and exploring your creative interests if you know you have no self-esteem and or you don't have friends. Um, certainly, if you don't have food, you're not going to be worried about solving math problems if you don't have breakfast in the morning. And so I think this helps you to understand at least an organized human motivation, even if it hasn't influenced sort of cognitive science and cognitive psychology in the way that we might want. And the other point that I would make about this is that when we talk about, as we will, um, embodied psychology uh, and, and, and embodied cognition, I think you really want to be thinking about these sorts of issues. So the need for food and water and warmth and rest, that's really going to influence our behavior and the ability of the environment to support that or enable that is going to be really, really important in understanding what people are going to do. Uh, you know, I hang out here at self-actualization most of the time. Uh, I didn't yesterday, yesterday, I had a problem on my foot and I had to see a podiatrist immediately. And so, no, sorry about that Monday morning meeting. It wasn't happening. I had to go and take care of the foot problem. I also had to take care of my dog and a few other things that were sort of lower down in this hierarchy. When uh, papers don't get written and proposals don't get submitted, I'm an unhappy camper, not down here because I'm worried about food, water, warmth, and rest, but way up at the top, self-actualization and making sure that you know I'm I'm actually achieving my full potential. So I think this is a, a useful framework for thinking about goals. Um, so neo-behaviorism did allow for at least the influence of this kind of stuff. Do you have a trouble? Yeah, we need that. Oh battery. Yeah. In this book, I'm, I'm not yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you for noticing. <laughs> that would have been terrible. Okay. A um, couple of things that did come out of, of the behaviorism line of work, um, the ineffectiveness of punishment. Uh, we know that you know, just beating people up with negative feedback and telling them that everything is wrong is just a really ineffective way to shape behavior in the way that we want. And you end up with this phenomenon we call learned helplessness, where uh, nothing that you do is right, and so you just stop trying. And that really comes from this behaviorism line of work. Um, I also want to point out that the work that went on here is this in this sort of not quite century, half 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 century, um, was incredibly mathematically oriented. Math well beyond anything that I can do. And that framework of mathematical formalism for describing human behavior really comes out of here, out of this behaviorism orientation. And it has a persisting influence. There's no doubt about it. Okay. Uh, but 
uh, it ran into some problems. Um, so the problem, the basic problem is that there were influences on what's going on in that black box that really couldn't be predicted by straight stimulus response relationships. Uh, for example, rat behavior turned out to be better modeled as consistent with the idea that there was a mental map of an environment in the rat's head rather than rogue behavioral sequences that said something like, well, you know, when you when the chute is open, turn right and then turn left and then turn right. No, it really looked like through a, a series of careful experiments that the rat kind of understood its environment and sought out its reward based on that rather than a simple sequence of, of um, steps. Um, we had evidence of learning between superficially dissimilar situations. And I would associate this kind of insight with the Gestalt psychologists who showed that you could learn something in one uh, environment and transfer it to a completely different environment. Why was that a problem? Because the whole stimulus response explanation of behavior that the behaviorists relied upon assumed that it was a replication of the stimulus that set off this chain of reaction. So, whoa, how are we going to explain this kind of thing that we call transfer in the absence of an identical environment. Another line of work, um, species specific constraint on what gets learned and when. So um, you probably are familiar with, I didn't bring up the video for this, Conrad, maybe you've seen this, Conrad Lorenz's um, pictures of um, him being the first thing that baby geese, I think, baby geese saw when they hatched and if he was the first thing that they saw when they hatched those baby geese followed him around forever um doesn't work if you show up later in the sequence of uh, you know growth for the for the baby geese there are um species specific constraints on um, response to particular stimuli like um, the shape of a bird's bill and the markings on a bird's bill to encourage the mother to feed the baby birds. So there's just a ton of work in this area called ethology that shows that there are species specific constraints on what gets learned and when. And that too threatens this explanation that we can predict behavior just looking at the stimulus. And, and the response. There's got to be something going on in the middle in that black box that is influencing behavior. Um, another sort of threat? Yes. Yeah. Between stimulus and response, there is always a bit of delay. Uh -huh. So I am always confused about that, like how psychologists consider that delay and analyze things. Yeah, you know, I, I did, God, way, 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 way back when, a tiny bit of work in this area, but I'm not an expert on the issues of, of delay. I think psychologists have been more captivated by the problem of variable reinforcement. So sometimes you get reinforced and sometimes you don't. And you know what, it, what does that do to behavior. Um, Savannah, do you know anything about delay in, in um, behaviorism? Delayed response, delayed reinforcement in behaviorism? Um, I mean, a little bit. Okay, what do you know? Because I, 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 that's going on in my brain. What do you know? And, and, you know, it does matter, right? You know, sort of like from Thorndike's perspective, you do have to get reinforcement proximal. Yeah, so in general, if you're trying to um, create sort of or enforce a behavior, you need reinforcement that occurs at a sufficient amount of time to actually like um, for the um, organism or the person to like be aware that they're connected, right? Um, 
And then approximately. eventually, if you wanna sort of um, sustain that behavior, you can vary the reinforcement schedule. Yeah. Um, you can make it kind of intermittent, um, but there is still sort of a base rate that you need to, um, a base rate and a base delay that you need to be able to meet um, if you wanna continue the behavior. You know, a lot of this has fallen out of fashion, except in clinical populations. Um, autism, for example, is a place where you'll still see this kind of stimulus response reward notion on, on behavior. But, you know, think about it from a computational complexity perspective. If I respond in a certain way to something in the environment and then X number of events and behaviors occur until I get a reward. How am I going to know what behavior to associate that reward with? Okay, but that is a very good point. That is an excellent point. I didn't put it here, uh, but it is relevant. And that is that species do have a relationship. They come you know, pre-equipped pre with a proclivity to associate things like smell and sickness and light and shock um, and it's not the same for every species so that also was a really huge threat to behaviorism the idea that there, there were sort of these preset analyses that you would provide relating the stimulus to to the, the response so yeah the 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 um the delay issue and the contingency and the proximity of reward um i think that would be best and, and temporal contiguity is really what that's called and that really comes from thorndike which would be like 1910 <laughs> something something way back then huh. uh, but you know but it, it just hasn't been other than the sort of the basic ideas that Sarah was just talking about I wouldn't say we're that preoccupied with this particular issue these days. Um, and then I want to talk about a line of thinking um, that also illustrated how you just can't ignore the black box. And that's the area that we'll call psychophysics. So um, here's a challenge from psychophysics. Experience is not a linear relationship with physical metrics and this this work started in like the 1800s um and so um if you if you look at the difference between this top pattern and this bottom pattern 10 and 20 i think it's really really obvious that there are more dots in the in the bottom pattern right the, in the 20 but if you look at the 110 and the 120 even though there are 10 more dots in the bottom panel you can't really see it as much. Now, maybe you can if you really look hard, but on first impressions, it's not nearly as obvious. And this says to you that there's some contribution of our perceptual processes to the interpretation of physical differences. And that um, is demonstrated in just a huge number of sensory processes. So this is a very, very enduring uh, phenomenon. And it's still applicable. So our estimation of distance is not linear with distance. Our estimation of price differences is not linear. So that 50 cent difference in price for a $2 item is very noticeable 
but a 50 cent difference in price for a thousand dollar item isn't notice noticeable at all. So every, you guys just suddenly just split to what, the, what we're talking about here. So this issue is still there and it tells you that there is a psychological component on top of the physics. We call it psychophysics because it's a, a manipulation on the physics. Uh, and I particularly wanted to show you this one. Um, one of the reasons that we're going down this pathway at all is because I do want to put some meat on the on the notion of um, embodied cognition so that you kind of get a sense of what it could be that our sensory and bodily processes are imposing on our behavior. And here is um, a, a very well-established curve um, on the x-axis here, we have frequencies. On the y-axis, we have physical decibels for sound. And what you have here is estimated um, amplitude impressions as a function of frequency. So let's take this 20, it's called fawns, this 20 fawn level curve. It says that here at 10 hertz, it seems to be just as loud as here at 100 hertz, which is just as loud as, as here at 1,000 hertz, et cetera. Do you see the, the point? This is equal loudness contours that are a function of the frequency. So you can't predict the impression of loudness as a mathematical combination of decibels and frequency as something to do with the perceptual equipment that we bring to bear on the impression of sound loudness. Uh, another thing that I want to point out to you is this little dip right here where, you know, between 1,000 and 10,000 hertz, and we seem to be particularly sensitive to that. Why do you suppose that is? An accident? We have a sensitive uh, the what what is the dip representing here? Yeah, what is what why 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 are we sensitive there? What could what could that possibly be? Because like uh, the value at the X is very large. Uh, it's 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 low. You don't need there. You don't need very much decibels at all to detect a sound over here at I don't know what we're at. You know, it's like uh, three thousand hertz, something like that. But you need a whole bunch if the sound is at at ten hertz. What? It's found it like the decibels are very few, then we cannot hear. Ah, but we can. Take these things. Yeah, we can. I can. I can. You can hear way down here at that particular frequency. Why? I'll chime in. Huh? I said I'll yeah. chime in. You're asking about the gap okay. from four to six kilohertz. Pardon me. You're asking why there's a dip. I can't see your cursor. So you're asking why there's a oh, dip. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You, 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 I'm sure you know the answer. Yeah, <laughs> because that's where speech is. Speech. That's the, the frequency, the general frequency of human speech. And we need to be particularly sensitive to that. 
threshold means the, the point at which you are equally likely to detect the sound. It's a kind of a psychophysical notion. So at, at whatever this is, minus, uh, I'm not sure what, uh, eight or so decibels, 50% of the time, you will be able to detect the sound at uh, whatever the scale is, about 3,000 hertz. Would each person have different sensitivities? No. Now, you know, yeah, there's such a thing as hearing loss, right? Yeah. Um, and, you know, so there's clinical manifestations of differences, but this is a you know, fairly generic description. And the, the reason I'm pointing this out is that it really forces you to appreciate the contribution of our perceptual system to the experience. And you can't, you can't get it from just a physical measure of hertz or, or decibel. Did you want to add something, Savannah? Yeah, I was just saying another fun fact. Um, so when you listen to loud noise, regardless of what frequency it's at, um, so like you uh, go to a lot of rock concerts or, um, you know, maybe you listen to a lot of screaming children, all of those sounds sort of regardless of their frequency sort of serve to concentrate hearing loss right around um, right like right in that speech frequency area because the way your like eardrum is shaped is actually serves to sort of concentrate sound at that area of your cochlea so when when you are overexposed to noise because of the structure of the ear the damage is going to be particularly at this speech region oh, okay area so don't go to loud rock concerts because you're going to be interfering with your ability to to hear speech the, in particular and the, the reason i bring that up is sort of that's you know a very clear example of sort of you know our hearing abilities are specifically and the structure of your ear is specifically adapted to hear speech because you're sort of serving to concentrate, you're serving to concentrate volume at that frequency range, which is generally the frequency range you want to listen to. This basic idea that there is an intervening process between, I'm doing, I'm using air quotes here, objective, physical reality and our experience of that physical reality is the one common point of agreement between contemporary psychology and that old Freudian stuff that you might have heard about. I always appreciate Freud for one thing and one thing only. I don't care about egos and super egos and all that stuff. That's not my thing. Uh, but this idea that there are interpretive processes that intervene between, ex between the physical environment and what we experience, that persists. Every psychologist believes that. Okay, um, now, okay, so here we are, we're saying, wow, we can't have that black box, it'd be a black box, you have to figure out what's going on there, if the goal is to predict human behavior and control human behavior. And so what we're going to try to do is understand this common cognitive architecture that is somehow separable from knowledge and experience. So all of us, you know, we were just talking, you were talking about, you know, the speech sensitivity issues. And I, and you said, well, isn't this different between people and I? No, no, 
That's the general relationship right there. And the idea was, yeah, you might, you might, for example, become more sensitive to certain sounds because let's say you're a musician or something and knowledge might contribute to your processing of the environment not just for music, but for anything, right? Or your experience or expertise or whatever. But there still should be a common core thinking equipment architecture um, without worrying about clinical issues, strokes and such, a common core architecture that determines behavior. And then what we're gonna do is we're going to program that architecture and that should be familiar to you guys, right? Um, and the combination of the architecture and the sort of the, the low level building blocks plus the program is gonna generate the behavior. And that's kind of the idea behind computational uh, cognitive models. Um, so we're gonna identify the features of all humans and we're going to come up with sort of a prototype human agent, uh, model and and tasks that depend on prior experience are going to be handled by in general you know without clinical issues in general by knowledge differences not by differences in the basic thinking equipment that we have and and because of this idea that we are modeling that that the science has to do with discovering the constancies and the commonalities, the thinking equipment, a large portion of the psychological community is not particularly interested in individual differences. So, you know, there is a group, there, there are psychologists who worry about them, some of them are even in our department, but, but in general, cognitive psychologists kind of wrinkle their nose at a theory of behavior that depends on individual differences. There might be something in there, but we view ourselves as scientists who are interested in identifying general properties of thinking equipment. And so we kind of turn up our nose at this individual difference thing. Um, I do want to show you a video and we'll look at that now. What the heck time is it? Oh my God. Um, and what did we say? We're going to start here? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We're going to start minute. just one second here. I'm going to introduce this fellow Ebbinghaus and, and Ebbinghaus developed a method for understanding human memory based on the idea of nonsense syllables as the stimuli that he would use to study sort of capacity and decay. Why did he do that? Because he wanted to discover the, the commonalities, the fundamental features of the architecture without worrying about the program. Okay, let's, let's play that. And we'll see how long we have to we have to go because I couldn't find the video that I in many of his experiments. He created lists of nonsense syllables such as hack, piff, zap, and then tested how long it took himself to memorize the lists. He used nonsense syllables so that the participant himself didn't have any prior associations with any of the words on any of the lists. This was important because it ensured that all lists were equally unfamiliar at the start of the experiment, an important source of experimental control. Some psychology experiments today still rely on nonsense syllables for the same reason. Ebbinghaus would read a list over and over at a steady pace, periodically testing himself to see if he could recite the list from memory. He then recorded the number of repetitions needed to recite the list perfectly. I'm going to call that initial repetitions. And that probably sounds to you like a dependent variable. But it wasn't his main dependent variable. Right? So he recorded his initial repetitions, and then he tested himself later 
and in that later test he recorded the number of nonsense syllables that he was able to recall correctly uh, right away. That's the uh, retention. And also the number of repetitions of the list he needed until he could recall the list perfectly again. And I'm going to call that his final repetitions. But neither of those is his main DV. So those are also not dependent yeah. variables. Ebbinghaus's dependent variable is savings. The difference between the initial and final number of repetitions needed expressed as a percentage of the initial repetitions. For example, if it took Ebbinghaus 20 repetitions to be able to recite a particular list the first time he memorized it, but only 15 repetitions to get to that point where it's perfectly memorized 24 hours later, that's a savings of five repetitions, which is 25% of the initial 20 repetitions. So savings of 25%. Now, if it seems like I'm going over this in way too much detail, it's because I really want this example to be concrete and to make sense for everyone. And if this example still doesn't make sense for you yet, don't worry. We're going to go over similar examples in class. Well, we won't. <laughs> of course, an experiment needs at least one independent variable that the experimenter manipulated in addition to the dependent variable they measured. And as you might expect, Ebbinghaus used different independent variables for different experiments. Here's one example. Uh, after he learned it perfectly the first time, Ebbinghaus continued repeating uh, the list. So he continued that repetition uh, in one of these experiments. So he learned it perfectly and then kept going. Uh, that's overlearning. Uh, so in that case, the experiment is about overlearning. The independent variable is the number of additional initial repetitions, and the result was that savings were greater when he added initial repetitions than when he did not. In other words, that overlearning promoted retention. Here's another example. To test Thomas Brown's hypothesis that associations are stronger for more recent pairings, that's the recency effect, Ebbinghaus used different retention intervals. That's the time between the initial and final. So I'm not expecting for different to lists. All this for, at all. So the experiment tested the re recency test, recency effect. The independent variable was the retention interval, the amount of time between tests, and the result was that his savings were less for longer intervals. And this is something we can graph as a forgetting curve. Okay. This will be. This is good enough for us right now. We can All right, one more example. Okay. So to test Aristotle's oh, principle yeah. of contiguity, that is, that adjacent knowledge. items on... Uh, to uncover the properties of the general properties of the thinking equipment, how it responds to repetition, how it responds to delay, etc. Et um, there is a piece in here which is extremely important, and that is the idea of forgetting. An important part of our cognitive architecture is the ability to forget. You can't have your brain cluttered up with everything that you ever learned. You're going to have computational problems if you do that, right? And so some of the interest in the forgetting problem really was initiated with Ebbinghaus's work on the properties of the thinking equipment, intentionally eliminating knowledge, which of course is rather ironic for this group, right? Because we're all about knowledge <laughs> and we're not we're very, um, um, what, what's the word that I'm looking for? Um, agnostic <laughs> about the structure of the thinking equipment. So don't forget about forgetting. It will come up later when we talk about procedural knowledge and uh, keeping up with a dynamic environment. You can't be lugging around 
old information that is no longer true because something evolved in the environment or you did something to change it, right? And so forgetting is actually something that has come up here when Ahmed has talked about, you know, there was a first lady at time one and a different first lady at time two. And you cannot have a retrieval process that is bogged down worrying about a first lady who has basically been replaced. So we worry about this long before you guys did. We're talking 1880 here. Okay, so for the history of computational cognitive modeling, I've, I've talked about behaviorism, I've talked about the need to understand the thinking equipment a little bit better because it seems to contribute to the ability to predict behavior. Um, I talked about this goal of isolating the properties of the architecture from the knowledge or the program that is submitted to that architecture. And here is uh, a model that John Laird provided, oh, it's about two years old or so, um, that kind of encompasses the general notions of the parts of a computational cognitive model. Um, the parts center around a working memory that is responsible for monitoring the current situation, pursuing your current goals, directing action, etc. It takes input from your perceptual processes and it also directs motor processes so that you can change the world. And of course, um, you know, your, your working memory can also direct attention to something in the environment and change, you know, oh my gosh, there is that hum going on in the background from the electric lights or something like that. Um, and also um, your motor system can change the state of the world, which feeds back into perception and, and so on. So there's this nice sort of cycle here. There's also two inputs to working memory. One is declarative long-term memory. We will talk about that. The other is procedural long-term memory. You guys tend to be very focused on declarative memory and declarative knowledge. There is a huge, important hunk of knowledge that's bound up in your ability to uh, affect procedures in the world, both mentally and, and, and physically. And I will be talking a little bit more about that. But I do want to point out that this whole model kind of isolates the cognitive pieces, the blue, the brown, and the red from the interactions with the environment. And that is a legacy of Newell's physical symbol system hypothesis. This comes from the 1980s, I think it's 1981. And, and the idea is that Whatever it is that's going down on down here in the yellow and the green is at least scientifically separable from whatever it is that's going on in the red, the blue, and the brown. The stuff in the yellow and the green provide symbolic representations of what's going on in the world. And our thinking is all about operating on these representations. Now that very idea is actually questionable in my view, but it certainly is a dominant theme in computational models of cognition. Is it clear what the problem is? You are operating on symbols when you think at the algorithmic level. We're not talking about what neurons are doing. We're talking about you know, how to describe this algorithm. And it is functionally an operation on mental symbols. Now, this notion of computational cognitive models is not without challenge. 
There are some inconsistencies with brain anatomy, although one brand of computational cognitive models has probably done a little bit better job on that than the other. Um, we do know that from a brain anatomy perspective, there are specialized modules that do specialized things, and that really isn't accommodated in your typical computational cognitive models. So, for example, there's a specialized face recognition module. We know that very well. There appear to be language specific modules in the brain that work differently than modules that are dealing with physical objects in the physical world. And it appears that there are potentially social modules in the brain that worry about social situations and fairness uh, and following the rules and things like that. And none of that seems to be particularly well represented in that little schematic that I gave you for the sort of the general overview of computational cognitive models. So symbol manipulation is separated from symbol creation. Um, and, and this is a problem because no doubt knowledge does seem to reach down and influence the way we interpret the physical environment. That doesn't seem to be particularly well accommodated there. I was just looking at some research the, uh, the other day where it kind of looks like there's um, representations of, of source that distinguish between modalities uh, at the working memory level. I'm not too happy with, like, with that. Uh, because that's very inconsistent with the physical symbol system hypothesis. But there's another threat. And this is one that I think Amitabha is, is particularly worried about. Um, and, and here the issue is whether or not manipulating symbols in the head is really an adequate explanation of human understanding. And for this, we need to look at a very famous demonstration called the Chinese room. Has anybody heard about the Chinese room here? Tarangi has. Anybody else? No? Nope. Well, you will now. And this is associated with John Searle. And it has been an extremely influential philosophical argument about the nature of understanding. Oh, yeah. OK. Oh, no, not this one. We need that one too, but not, not there, not yet. Searle, Chinese room. This one. Uh, I don't know. This one. Ah, this one. Yes. Here we go. Sixty second adventures in thought. Number three, the Chinese room. Can a machine ever be truly called intelligent? American philosopher and Rhodes scholar John Searle certainly can. In 1980, he proposed the Chinese Room Thought Experiment in order to challenge the concept of strong artificial intelligence, and not because of some 80s design fad. He imagines himself in a room with boxes of Chinese characters he can't understand and a book of instructions which he can. If a Chinese speaker outside the room passes him messages under the door, Searle can follow instructions from the book to select an appropriate response. The person on the other side would think they're chatting with a Chinese speaker, just one who doesn't get out much. But really, it's a confused philosopher. Now, according to Alan Turing, the father of computer science, if a computer program can convince a human they're communicating with another human, then it could be said to think. The Chinese room suggests that, however well you program a computer, it doesn't understand Chinese, it only simulates that knowledge, which isn't really intelligent. But then sometimes humans aren't that intelligent either. Get a machine to mimic the outputs of human intelligence, but does it understand, will it ever understand, should it understand in the way that humans do? Let's see if we have, do we have time for one more? Um, there are a couple of other uh, challenges to the common model that uh, Laird articulated. 
Yeah. Yeah. Where's the emotion? Yeah. Where's the motivation? Where's the goals? Where do the goals come from? This is something that I've spent quite a bit of time on myself. Um, what are the implications of the specific capabilities of the sensors and infectors? I, I went into a big long thing for you about how ears are differentially sensitive to speech. Where and how does that really important finding figure into that common computational model? And if we're going to get to the point where we're thinking about embodied cognition, that is the influence of our bodies and our motor systems and our perceptual systems and our brains on behavior, gosh, it kind of would be nice <laughs> if those features showed up in the common computational model. Um, here is uh, an alternative um, that Larry Barcelou articulated in 2020, and it's the situated action model. And the idea is that we need something a lot richer than what we just saw from Laird. We need to represent the environment. We need to have some capacity to identify relevance in terms of goals, values, norms, and personal identity. We need emotion and motivation. We need a motor and executive a control system, and then we need outcome, and that is all going to feed for feed back into the environment. So if you look at it from this kind of schematic about, about the models that we need to be creating, you need a model of the environment, the body, cognition, something about modalities. Remember I said that modality thing is, is tricky from a computational cognitive modeling perspective. It's be important, but it is. Stuff comes in from the environment impinges on cognition, has an impact or, or implication for affect, and that is going to direct how you examine the environment and interact with the environment, um, etc. So, so we're swinging back. Look, so look what happened here. We started out worrying about just the environment. Then I said, well, wait a minute, there's all this stuff about what goes on in our thinking equipment. We probably need to have that in there. And now we're saying, but wait a minute. <laughs> we need to go back and worry again about how we are interacting with the environment. And so you're sort of seeing this pendulum swinging back and forth in terms of the interest in the research community. And I think that is a good place to stop today. And boy, oh boy, have I got a lot more to do. Um, so I don't know what to say about, uh, you know. Can you cover it in two classes? Huh? Can you cover it in two more? I think I can do it in two. I certainly can't. I there's no way I can get it done in one. Maybe we can request to publish it in the next class. Yeah. I because I there's just, just not possible, and I really do worry about the procedural knowledge piece because this is a piece that you guys are really missing in the way you think about knowledge. So I want to get there. I don't. You know, if we don't go back to the original models for the natural language chat. That's okay. okay. So thank you.